the general topic is, is heart valve disease. Uh, when, when, you, when we talk about things with your heart, there's really sort of three general areas uh, with the heart itself. One of them is the blood vessels on the heart. Those are the coronary arteries. Those are the things that are right on the surface of your heart that gives the blood to the muscle of the heart. The muscle itself is about this thick, all right? Some parts a little thinner, but the coronary arteries are the most common things that you hear about, the most common things that you may have to get treated for or have something done for, all right? Because those are the things that control the blood going to the actual muscle of your heart. And when people talk about uh, blockages of the blood vessels or they may have to have something to do with taking a pill for their cholesterol to get these blockages down or they have to have some sort of stent or surgery, those are the things that we're talking about. And these are the coronary arteries, blood vessels, these red things here. So they're on the surface of the heart and they can get blockages in them. Okay. The other general area is the heart rhythm. And you may hear people having a pacemaker put in, or they have a atrial fibrillation, or they have some palpitations, or they have some other rhythm problems that need perhaps medications, or they need uh, a pacemaker put in, or an ablation, or they have other medicines they got to take to control this heart rhythm. That's really the electrical system of the, of the heart that we're talking about. The third area, and that's really kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit today, is that of the heart valves. Those are little devices, you might call them, that separate the chambers of the heart. There's four chambers to your heart, two upper, two lower. These are the upper. These are the lower down here. And it, between those chambers, there are valves. And you can see right here is a device that separates this chamber from that chamber. Over here, there's another one that separates this chamber from that chamber. There's four of these, all right? Now, in adults, unlike kids, there's really two major valves that can cause people problems. And that is, in fact, one of them being this valve, the mitral valve, here, okay? The other one being a little bit dip, more difficult to see, it's sort of stuck down in here. It corresponds to the aortic valve. So we've got a little bit different diagram here that you can see for the aortic valve. All right, I'll, I'll just pass that around. That's the aortic valve there. Now, two things. So of the four, there's two that we tend to talk about, the mitral and the aortic. So the mitral valve, this one right here really separates the blood that comes back from your lungs from the chamber that does all the pumping, the left ventricle, all right? So the mitral valve, if you have problems with that where it leaks some or has problems, the valve doesn't work. The blood goes backwards and it goes into your lungs and you get short of breath. That's the most common problem with the mitral valve. If it, it, leaks, you get shorter breath because the blood sort of backs up in your lungs. Years and years and years ago, people used to have rheumatic fever. This valve used to get very, very, very tight and narrow down. The blood wouldn't even get from really the lungs into the pumping chamber of your heart. So people really got shorter breath from rheumatic heart disease. Still see some of that, but less than, than we have, you know, 25, 30 years ago in, in patients. Now, <clears throat> The most common valve problem that one has when they get older is aortic valve problems, aortic stenosis. I'm going to shut this. Can you shut that? Can you come in and shut it? And that's the valve I passed around. That's a valve that sits right through here. I'm showing around. It separates the blood from the pumping chamber of your heart with the aorta, 
okay, right through here. That valve that you can see is got typically has three pieces to it. It's typically very thin. Oh, like sort of little, little firm tissue paper, basically. Very pliable, opens, shuts, opens, shuts. But as you get older, <clears throat> that valve in many people just starts to get hard. And when it really gets bad, it gets chunky. It's got rocks on it, all right? And that's very common. So once you get into your 70s, 80s, about 8 to 9% of people will have really significant aortic valve stenosis. And about 3% of people, which is pretty darn high, that are in their high 70s, 80s, have bad aortic stenosis that would require some sort of treatment like surgery. Right? And we're starting to see more of this also because you know, people are, in general, living longer, got a much more increasing elderly population. And, and so it really, across the spectrum, is increasing in uh, frequency. So for perspective, that valve usually opens about the size of a 50 cent piece. So if you were to take about, oh, a 50 cent piece roughly, that'd be about what the size of it would be. When it gets narrowed down, it only opens about the size of a dime. So <clears throat> what happens, think of like a person playing the trumpet, trying to push really through a small hole. You get short of breath, you get fatigued, your legs swell, have a lot of problems. So aortic stenosis, much, much more common problem in older folks older folks, and the mitral valve, common also, but not quite as common as uh, aortic valve problems. <clears throat> now, many times, this is just picked up incidentally by your physician maybe examining you, or they're doing some other test or something else, and they say, oh, you have a murmur. Well, that just means that, <clears throat> think of like when you put your finger on a garden hose and you hear that noise, that's what the valve is doing to the blood. So if this valve is normal, it opens nicely and shuts, the blood just flows right through, it gets a little bit of narrowing. It's like you put your finger on it, it makes a noise. Same thing with the mitral valve. If it leaks a little bit, that there's turbulence in there, the valve makes the blood make a noise, that's what the doctor hears, all right? So that's what a heart murmur is. It's the, the, the sound of the blood rushing through that valve that's abnormal, OK? It's, a, it's an acceleration process. So that's how a lot of these things are picked up. And then we all think of ultrasound and various other modalities to diagnose them more specifically. Now, <clears throat> what's been changing significantly in the last several years is this. And I'm going to pass around some things here, what you're going to see. and. These are heart valves. These are artificial heart valves. These come from uh, either pigs or cows. They're both very common, commonly used throughout the world. And they, they do great. They, they last very well for many patients. And I'll just set one over here. I wouldn't open it up, though, if it's got a bunch of formalin on it. You can just slide that down. Look at that one. But <clears throat> some of these are made out of the actual pig valve itself. They take a pig's heart, preserve the valve, and, and redo it several times, and then, and then we'll use it. The ones that come from a cow, they take the lining. Remember, if you're on the, on the farm, the sac that's around the, the cow's heart, they'll take that sac, they'll restructure it, they'll cut it up. Technicians sew it on a valve that kind of looks like you see here. All right? I believe that's a cow, cow valve, and that's a pig valve there, I believe. But I didn't look at it that closely. All right. Go ahead. I thought those were mechanical in there. I have a mechanical valve right here. Oh. So you mean those are different? From those are tissue. We, we would call those tissue valves. Uh, those valves come from animals. The one in here is a mechanical valve. All right. And <clears throat> this is made out of a little bit of Dacron felt, but also a chemical or a, a substance called pyrolytic carbon. Very, very thin. So metal valve, plastic valve. This white thing is not part of the valve. That's the valve holder we use when we put it in. So the real working part is this black part and this white part. Here, I'll give it to you. You can look at that right away. So depending on what your age is, it kind of depends on what kind of valve you would have put in uh, for the aortic valve. In general, younger 
patients tend to get a mechanical, a little older tend to get a tissue valve. Risks and benefits either way. The, the mechanical valve uh, needs blood thinner all the time, forever and ever and ever. That valve there doesn't need blood thinner. Uh, the tissue valves tend to wear out over time, depending how old you are when you have it put in. The, the metal or plastic ones don't wear out, but they have their own set of complications to just in general because of the potential bleeding issues the older you get. Yes, you can hear that one. Yeah. And that's the one, most common one that's a mechanical valve. It's called a St. Jude valve. And uh, patients can hear that. Okay, it does click. So the tissue valve, you don't have to take the blood thinner? Not for the valve. That's right. That's right. So, you know, if you look at recommendations and such that's out there, uh, people that are roughly 65 or older would tend to get a tissue valve. In general, younger than that, get a mechanical valve. But that's all quite variable because some patients don't want to take the blood thinner. And so it, it sort of goes back and forth. And patients are tending to more and more want the tissue valves in general. They, they, they've gotten much, much better the last 15 years. So uh, now just to, to talk about you know, the mitral valve, we'll also use tissue valve replacements for the mitral valve or mechanical valves. The mitral valve can, can often, in younger folks, get repaired, and it doesn't have to get replaced. Uh, so we, we aim to try and repair it, patch it up, fix it up in younger folks. The older you get, you can get some calcium on there, makes the repair less, uh, less predictable. And older patients, there's a trend toward getting the valve replaced because of calcium issues, and the valve is, is more degenerated. Right? In a human, you would think that the valve probably lasts a lifetime. Yes. Normally. Yeah. So why doesn't the pig valve or the tissue valve last? I mean, it Forever. sounds like well, it wears out faster. Or well, you know, the uh, the younger you are, you, you wear the valve out quicker. So if 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 a thirty year old person had a tissue valve in, pig valve, or, they'd wear that out probably in about eight years. Now, once you get to be 65 or 60 years of age, for a number of reasons, that valve doesn't wear out as quick. You know, you don't, you don't react to it. You don't tear it up. It doesn't get calcium on it like it does with younger folks, all right? And again, you know, it's not your own tissue. And no matter how good they try to, to, to put different chemicals in it or treat it a certain way, it's not your own valve. It's just not your own valve. And so, we have to take anti-rejection. You, you do not, but you know, I mean, very, very rarely, you know, people, even a, an older person, will wear one out really quickly. Pretty uncommon, very unusual, it can happen. We also use valves from humans, like cadavers. We've used those some, but they also they they wear out also because they're not your own tissue. So that's the reason, like in the mitral valve. If you can, in a younger person, we would try to repair it, to keep their own valve in there, all right? Now, what has been absolutely uh, earth-shattering the last several years for the aortic valve is the fact that there's really been a, a, a merging of technologies and a merging of specialties between cardiology and surgery and how we approach things. and. <clears throat> For the last 10 years, really, there's been a lot of changes going on. And for the aortic valve now, and especially as patients get older, there's other ways to replace this valve, the aortic valve, without having typical surgery. That means uh, without getting put on some sort of bypass machine, without having your heart stopped, without having even a, a portion of your, your chest open, making your recovery easier, all right? And that's called transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Transcatheter, sort of valve on a stick, basically, is what it is. And uh, that was first done about seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, in Canada. And it's been available for the last four years in Europe. It's just gone through an evaluation period in the US. And it just got approved in November. 
and we have started to do that just this past month. Now, what that is for currently is for people who that are quite debilitated, have a lot of other problems, don't feel that we can get them through regular surgery, and it's a good option for them if they have a really, really bad heart valve. And I have a picture of it here, or I have actually a device here, and I'm going to send these around to you. Uh, try not to touch them, but you can, you can look at them and, and, and get a good view, and we'll, we'll send them down the way here. This is a, a tissue valve. It comes from a cow. It's very similar. The leaflets you'll see are very similar. But it's basically a valve on a stent, all right? And there's two sizes there that are available. And <clears throat> that valve is in the position you would have it in your, in your body. But it, it, it's crimped on a stick or on a catheter. And then it's delivered through the groin all the way around and placed in your heart. Jay, do you want to try and show this? We have one or two videos I'll show you that will explain this a little bit better. Uh, but again, this, this, is, this is a very, very, very big deal because it's so different. That's plenty. I think that's, that's great. All right? I think it's only about a minute or a minute and a half or so. So this is a valve that's going to be put in through the groin. I think they're going to show you the diseased valve that we're talking That's the aortic valve again. So we're going to start by going through one of the blood vessels of the leg. And the blood vessels have to be a big enough size that it can ultimately accommodate this device. All right? And the first thing that's done is that we would balloon this very, very narrowed valve open so that we have space to put the new valve. So this is a balloon, basically, that cracks this valve open, all right? This is a very, very, very old uh, procedure, cracking the valve open. That's been done uh, 30 years, all right? But it never, by itself, doesn't do a whole lot of good. And then here, you're going to see this valve that's all crimped on this catheter. And it's brought through around under uh, x-ray guidance and e echo guidance in the correct position. And it's going to get blown up. And that takes about, to actually do that part there takes about 20 seconds to do that there. All right? And then we'll check and see how that looks on echo and ultrasound and such. And that patient's had their aortic valve replaced. What happens to the old valve? It just spreads it out? Or that's a great question. And that's one of the things that, that has to get worked out better. You can see right here, the old valve's around the edge. It, get, it got pushed out of the way. It got pushed out of the way. So <clears throat> when you have regular valve surgery, that, the old valve's all removed. That old valve's all removed, taken out. New valve sewn in, put in. Okay. So. What are the valves? What other ones do you have? Is that it? Now, that's one of the things that, 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 that has to get improved upon because when you do leave the old valve there, there is a risk there for stroke. All right? But this is a X, this is how it looks when we're doing the actual procedure. That's the valve right there. And then we, we, we blow it up. It's got a little balloon in it. And we'll, we'll blow it up and, and inflate the valve like that. You saw a little. I think there was a, it's on a balloon and you blow it up, okay? But your point is, since the old valve is there, there, you, there is a risk of stroke with, with this. And the actual, the risk of stroke right now is, is higher than with regular surgery. But <clears throat> these, the patients that have this are really at the, you know, they're in dire straits because they really can't have surgery. So what's happening, and this is really the tip of the iceberg with this sort of treatment, all right? And the valve that we're using is really first generation stuff. Other devices are coming out. Other things are getting better. It's like anything else. It's, it's only going to get better. But, but, but uh, for patients right now that are too sick, maybe perhaps a little too frail, have some other medical reasons that they just maybe shouldn't have surgery, 
It's a great option. It's going to continue to get improved. It's going to be continued to be used more and more frequently. Right, right now, go ahead. How do you determine the size of valve that you're going to fight? Ultrasound, or echo, we call it. That's done ahead of time. And right now, there's two sizes. So we have a, basically a, a chart we look at, and we measure several times on a certain side of sort of ultrasound. Because also, the size of the device also influences how big the blood vessel in your leg has to be. Smaller valve, you can have a smaller blood vessel. Bigger valve, you need a bigger blood vessel to get the thing through. Uh, but the percentage of patients that will be treated either like this or through a different incision, if they can't have it this way, perhaps a little incision here, a little incision here without the heart-lung machine, without um, you know, going on the heart-lung machine, having your heart stop, is going to be done more and more and more frequently, all right, without question. And, and I think that the recovery will be different, be some advantages to it, and I think it's going to be applicable to more and more patients over the next two to three, four, five years. Again, right now, we're doing it on folks that really are a little too ill, too debilitated, where we don't feel that they should have regular surgery. But I believe that that will slowly be changing. All right? So. Uh, how, does, how does that stay in there? I mean, when you're doing surgery, you're talking about sewing the right. tissue on. Right. Now you have the stent thing. Yeah. It blows up, yeah. The, 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 the calcium of the valve keeps it anchored. The calcium keeps it anchored. So. There are some people who have aortic valves that just leak. They don't have calcium there. This valve wouldn't be an option because there's really nothing to hold the valve in. All right? Because we do have patients on occasion who have real, real leaky valves. They have to get those fixed, too, in the aortic position. So the calcium holds it in. Now, the other thing I said, to show you how different things are, this this valve, the people that developed it didn't know anything about heart surgery. They didn't know anything about hearts. They didn't know anything about cardiology. They were purely engineers. And they knew nothing about hearts. They weren't doctors. They were engineers. The company sat down with them almost eight, nine years ago and said, look, we want to develop a valve on a stick. Can you help us? And these people did. They didn't know anything about medicine. I'm telling you, things are changing for this kind of problem really pretty dramatically, you know? And uh, again, I've been out, I've been doing this for 15 years, 17 years. You're gonna see more and more things change like this. Same thing goes for the mitral valve. That's a little slower because the mitral valve is much, much more complex from a valvular standpoint. But again, you know, th things are changing and so, uh, I'll stop there. Any, any kind of questions, I'll answer. How do, you, how do you diagnose the difference between a mitral valve and, and another valve? How do you know which problem you have? That can be diagnosed with your stethoscope because, I mean, I mean that's the real nice way to diagnose is to say, hey, what we, we'll get an ultrasound on you. you know? Take a stethoscope. The mitral valve problem is typically appreciate in a different area of your heart or of your chest. Mitral valve typically is right here, down by your armpit, down by your breast. Aortic valve murmur is typically right here. Sounds a little bit different. Symptoms are a little bit different. A little bit different, but all the same. But often, you can pick it up with your stethoscope. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between a leaky valve and a, just a valve that needs replacement? A leaky valve. Well, you said some are leaky valves. Yes. The valve, the, well, you, well, specifically, you have a lub-dub, lub-dub, right? When they listen, the squeakiness occurs at a different time of the lub-dub. If you have a tight valve, it happens during systole. If you have a leaky valve, it happens versus diastole for an aortic valve. And for a mitral valve, it's just the opposite, right? So that's the good thing about a physical exam. People still do them. 
I would hope. Yeah. Yeah. What do they mean by a calcified curtain wall? Yeah. And how dangerous is it? What causes it and how dangerous? So a calcified heart valve, you can have a calcified valve, but the valve still works fine. All right? Now, many people have a calcified valve in some part of the valve is calcified. Maybe you would look here. There's some calcium around the outside here. Maybe that you have a mitral valve <clears throat> over here, and it's got some calcium on it somewhere, but it still works pretty well. All right? Some of those stay just the same forever and ever. Sometimes the calcium progresses, or it affects part of the way the valve works, and then it gets worse. All right? It's very common to have some calcium on your valve with, with uh, age, especially the mitral valve. We can see it on an x-ray. Don't think much of it at all. That works well for a long, long, long time. Same thing for the, the area. You can have a valve that has a little bit of calcium on it. Stays like that for a long time. OK? Yeah. What, what causes that calcified? What causes it? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know about that. Now, now, people would say, well, I got a little calcium on my valve. Can I take a bunch of Lipitor? Will it make it better? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Maybe part of your family history, maybe the way God made you, you know. So they've tried to use fancy cholesterol medicines for the heart valves to stop the narrowing. Doesn't really work. Doesn't really work. So. Yeah. But this, you know, it helps you in other areas, the rest of your body. Yeah. I have another question. If you can do all this and, and take that stick thing on a stent yeah. and put it in there, yeah. and it breaks open the other bad valve, yeah. why can't you suck it out the same way, the bad valve part, and mm -hmm. leave the good one? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that uh, there may be something like that that, that, that happens. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of innovations going on, you know, about, about how to deal with it and, and, and those kind of things. Maybe we'll open it up a different way. You know, uh, there's, you know, to, to make the operation simpler, I mean, from the surgical side, looking at basically having a little, having a surgery where we take the valve out, but we don't, we don't sew the valve back in. We got some other ways to, to, to fix it in your heart without it requiring a bunch of suturing. It takes about you know, 15 sutures to sew it in, keep it nice so it doesn't leak and have issues. That takes a little time. But, you know, and any time you can do something more effectively, quicker, I mean, you would always opt for that, as long as it's just as effective. But that we haven't figured out, the they haven't got the suction part done yet. Yeah, you know, it's little tiny stuff like sand, some of the stuff, and you can't get it all. And it's, it's very crude to try and do that, so, yeah. Any, any other questions, whatever you got. Right, go ahead. I have a question. If you've already had open heart surgery and have had a valve repair, uh -huh. how long can you keep that valve in place? Uh, okay. Well, <clears throat> it depends on, really, what the repair is doing, how it looks, how it's getting along. But if it looks pretty good, it should treat you right the rest of your life. Okay, so if the valve repair is look, looks good, it's working well, the valve's not significantly leaking, it should stay like that, and you should do fine. Now, <clears throat> the most common valve that's repaired is a mitral valve. You, the, the mitral valve, and I'll show you, it's very, very, very complex over here. Lots of, lots of attachments to it. <clears throat> it can get repaired a number of ways. Sometimes you may have had, some people will have a mitral valve repair and it looks fine for several years. Then something else changes on the valve. Okay, maybe a, a cord prolapses or tears. A different pathology makes the valve leak. Do you understand? So if you had a, We'll, the cord, we'll call it. If you had that repaired the first time, and then they put a ring in, and that looks good, then that should do very well. But you typically know how things are going to be the first few months, how things are going to be the after surgery. All right. Now, 
let's say you've had a valve repair or you had a valve replacement with a tissue valve, okay? Maybe you were 65 or 70 and you had one of those pig valves put in or whatever it was, tissue valve. Not one of these, not one of the metal ones. Now, instead of having regular surgery again and you, maybe you've gotten up in years, you can do a valve in a valve, okay? Where you would either go through the groin or make a limited incision here or up here and we would put one of these valves inside the pig valve. Valve and a valve, all right? That's being done more frequently, especially outside the U.S. So again, you know, and even if some people who have had mitral valve repairs are coming back and having actually this valve put in the mitral position in certain situations. Would it be applicable for a otherwise healthy person, young of age? No, no. But it may influence what kind of valve you have put in. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we're seeing in some little younger patients that maybe are on the fence about a mechanical or a tissue valve, they're going to say, well, just give me a tissue valve. I'll come back in 12, 15 years. You can put a valve inside the old one. And, well, there may be some real validity to that. So it's not crazy. It's not crazy. So, yeah. I understood you correctly on the mechanical valve. If you put one of those in, you have to be on medications for the rest of your life. But does that same thing hold true for the tissue valves? That's the biggest difference. The mechanical valves has to be on Coumadin because the valve will, will get blood clot on it if the blood isn't nice and slippery. Right? You get clots on it. So if you have a mechanical valve, you have to be on Coumadin, and it's going to be Coumadin for the next couple of years at least until these other medicines are all approved, like you might have heard of Pradaxa or something. It's not approved for that. But <clears throat> the valve, is, is, it's a metal valve, plastic valve. You, gotta, you have to be on blood thinner. And, you know, it's a little different being on that for, with, for Coumadin instead of having some other reason to be on Coumadin. Oftentimes, if you're on Coumadin for something else, you can have that stop for a few days. Or you miss a dose, well, you know, not the end of the world. But it, you can't do that with a mechanical valve. You really have to have your blood thinned out pretty religiously. Otherwise, you'll get clots on it. So, so that's why in older folks, we tend to avoid those kind of valves because, you know, you can you, you fall, break your hip, bruise your elbow or something, and you've got to be on Coumadin. It's a real problem, real problem. So we, tr we try to avoid those, try to avoid them, older folks. One of the biggest drawbacks on Coumadin take. Are you asking me what are the biggest drawbacks? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, I try not to prescribe it cause, uh, since I have never taken it, all right? Some people do very, very well with it, don't have any issues. Some people have bleeding issues. They always have to go to the doctor and get the level checked. It's either up or down. You have to have a lot of dietary modifications, you know, certain kinds of vegetables a case of glass of wine, those kind of things. There's millions of people on Coumadin that do fine. It's been around a long time. But it's one of those things, again, you know, sometimes, you know, over the time, you can have some bleeding issues. You can bleed from your, your rear end or your nose or have to go to the hospital for bleeding. So there's, there's some disadvantages to it. There are some medicines that at least one that's become available to be used as a replacement for Coumadin in certain patients who need that medicine, like, like for atrial fibrillation, we call it. But those other medicines aren't approved yet to be used for valves. I think they probably will, all right, you know, but uh, nothing's perfect. And, you know, and Coumadin is used, too, because it's cheap. It's cheaper. These other new medicines are much, much more expensive, and the Coumadin for many people, it works out fine. But there's always disadvantages to, to everything. So, okay? Let's say you have a bad blockages on your coronary arteries, right? These blood vessels here, okay? What you're what you going to have to do, you have to be vegan. And that, I mean, I don't mean vegetarian. I mean, I'm talking you don't, eat, you don't eat any oils, you don't eat any eggs, you don't eat any meat. You're eating plants, okay? 
and then you're probably going to have to take some cholesterol lowering agent as well. Okay, but you've probably heard of things like the Dean Ornish program. That's a that's a that's a dietary program. All right, and there's also a program out of the Cleveland Clinic by Esselstein, and there's something called Forks Over Knives. If you ever heard of that, Google that once. You'll get a kick out of that. Forks Over Knives. Okay. But honestly, uh, can it be reversed? Yeah, it can be. Now, is it going to be 100%? Is it going to be just clean? No, it won't be. It won't be clean. You, 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 can, you, can, do a, you can take a picture two or three years later, and, and there will be some decrease in the plaque. That, that, that's been shown. Now, you know, the issue is you know, that, that's, that's a life-changing undertaking, right? But, you know. Uh, Are these I don't. I don't drink the breast milk from other animals. I don't know. I, mean, I don't do that. Are these procedures all currently being done in Lincoln at the Hard Rock? Yes. Yeah. We're the only place that's doing this. This. This place. Only place that's doing this in Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason is it. It takes a lot of people, and we. You know, over the years, it takes cardiologists and surgeons standing side by side, anesthesiologists. Uh, we've really been working on it for about the last four years to bring this online. Yeah. And, and we've been evaluating a lot of patients, and uh, so that's where it's currently at. Yeah, and I don't. I think it's going to be at select centers in the U.S. just because of the sort of undertaking it requires. Yeah. And you have done the stents. Yes, for the valves. Yes, we did two two in December. Yeah. yeah I've been two. Did two. Yep. Do you have any statistics on who had strokes <coughs> and how many were successful surgeries? Yeah. You mean like. Those two patients, or in general? In general. Sure. <clears throat> Specifically, the United States had a trial. And if you want to Google partner, partner trial, OK? That was in about 21 centers in the US, started five years ago. For people that were not operable candidates with aortic stenosis. So two surgeons had to evaluate the patient. Uh, let me use, use you as an example. Let's say two different surgeons would evaluate you and said, you know, ma'am, I think surgery is too much for you. You're not going to recover. You're not, you know, your quality of life is going to be really compromised just trying to recover from surgery, OK? Or I think, I don't believe we can get you through it with a reasonable chance of having success. So those patients, all right? Were then that we're talking about. They had the valve done through their leg, okay? Their success rate was 95% at 30 days, okay? So at 30 days, 95% of them were alive, okay? They had a 5% incidence of stroke at 30 days, 5%, okay? Now that is higher, that's probably twice the rate you'd have if you had surgery regarding stroke, but there's other things that involve the surgery, okay? And I'm a surgeon. So uh, at the end of one year, you had a 70% likelihood of being alive at one year if you had the valve put in. If you didn't, you had a 50% chance of being alive at one year, okay? So the absolute reduction in death was 20%. Improvement in survival at one year, okay? At two years, 30% increase in survival. That's a, if you look at statistics for survival, that's a very, very, very dramatic difference, okay? Now, what was striking is, that, again, the people that didn't have anything done, half of them had passed away in a year. A very, very, very high number. Higher than we would have predicted in general. Didn't think it was going to be that high. But again, I mean, you know, so again, these were very, very ill patients, couldn't have stuff done, all right? And that's who it's being applied to right now. And so, but I do think that that is going to change. It's going to be applied to different patients because the outcomes are continuing to improve, all right? Uh, th those outcomes, when I say 95%, that, that's actually good for those, that group of patients. It was much lower than we, much better than they would have been predicted to do. All right. The typical, uh, for an 80-year-old patient who has heart surgery, 
the 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 survive the 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 survivor is 97 percent. Okay, so very 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 high likelihood for for an 80 year old patient to do very very well with surgery in itself. Okay, so those are so the results in these patients were pretty good. Yeah, but again, there's a lot of stuff to work out, and the stroke it's real. 300. Yeah, 300 patients. Yeah. They screened about uh, 3,600, actually. Yeah, so about um, only about 11 or 12 percent of the people that were looked at actually got in the trial. Yeah. And there's different other arms to it, but the, 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 the thing that we're really talking about is this, this group of patients. All right? Yeah. The two you did in December, they're both doing fine? They are doing fine. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're doing well. And so it hasn't. Yep, we're, we're you know, excited, to, but there's a lot of screening, a lot of looking at it, a lot of talking to family, a lot of talking to doctors. Yeah, so. Uh, so the quality except, of their life, people that have this done, yeah. are they up around doing things? Or they are, more? they are, they are, yeah. And the people that, that we're looking at, you know, one of the things uh, that, you, you know, is recovery, is recovery, right? And you know, if, if if you may be a little older, but you may be strong and drive and do your own things, get around and live at home, and well, those people are going to be fine with surgery. They really will. But if you have someone who maybe uses a walker, their vision's not good, they don't drive anymore, have difficulties getting out of bed, have a hard time doing a lot of their daily things at home, then their recovery is really going to be dramatically challenging with surgery regular surgery as we know it, okay? So if you can then make the recovery easier, they're going to do better, all right? Yeah, and especially if, you have, if your lungs are really compromised. Some people have lungs that are really, really compromised and not from smoking. They just have lo other lung issues, all right? So it's nothing that they ever did. It, it, for whatever reason, they have bad lungs. Those people don't really do well with, with certain kinds of surgery, uh, you know? but people that can't walk well, a lot of arthritis, mobility is challenging, don't drive anymore. You know, those are the kind of folks that, that, that more and more are being evaluated for this. But yet, mentally, they're sharp. They read the paper. They, you know, their grandchildren visit them. They try to do things, but they just, they just can't because of, 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 of other issues. So, yeah. Any other questions? How many bad hospital exits out here? Yeah, 63. Yeah. yeah, but it's the busiest heart center in the state, 600 heart surgeries a year. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Our hospital's and, been open since May of 03. Yeah. And Dr. Waddell is one of the four surgeons um, that helped start that. We had a fifth surgeon, but he retired, Dr. Hedrich, retired last summer. So these guys have been around mm -hmm. Lincoln for quite a number of years and doing their thing here. So. And the staff, in addition, Dr. Waddell attested this, the staff is just as important. We have very tenured staff, both in the OR and the cath lab, and up on the nursing floor, too. What are they combining, then, from St. Elizabeth? Or what's going to still be done at St. E's, and what's yeah. being done out here? Yeah. Well, you know, St. Elizabeth always did a little bit of heart surgery, but Anytime you get to a certain number of surgeries, you know, you got to sort of reassess, well, should we still be doing surgery, you know? And that's true for a lot of programs throughout the country. There's a lot of consolidation going on. You should have do, you know, it's clearly the more that you do, the better you're going to be at it. It's like anything else. And, you know, you don't need to have surgery on the site to be able to do all kinds of other cardiology stuff. You know, years and years ago, you, oh, you had to have a surgeon in the hospital before you could do anything else, but that's all changed. And if you look at many places throughout the country, and throughout the Nebraska, you don't, you, don't, you, know, you, don't have, you don't have surgery right on that site. So you have everything else, do all everything else, but if you actually knew you have surgery, you just get transferred over. And, and it was done in Omaha, I think a year and a half ago or two years ago with one of their hospitals already, you know, in, in their system. So I think you're going to see more of that. It's going to be, it's going to be more and more common. It's like even way back when, you know, uh, Brian East versus Brian West, you know, they sort of consolidated their stuff. I used to go to Brian West years ago, 
to, for cardiology stuff to see patients and stuff, and that's all been sort of transitioned over and stuff. So, uh, yeah. Could you remind me again which valve is affected if you have rheumatic fever? Well, they both, all four valves can be affected. The mitral valve is the most commonly affected one. That's the one right over here. But the aortic can also be affected. But the most common one is rheumatic. Or sorry, is mitral one is the most common one for rheumatic. Yeah, yeah. Still seen a lot in other parts of the world, uh, you know, obviously. But we don't, and I'm seeing less of that surgically. Uh, but, uh, no. How about the other two valves? You know, you know, we, the, the, we, we, the, the third valve is something called the tricuspid valve. That valve usually has leakage because one or two of the other ones have leaked. So it's kind of like another pop-off valve, you know. If the mitral valve has a lot of problems, then maybe the tricuspid will leak, all right? The least common valve that we see having problems is the pulmonary valve. That valve is very commonly affected in kids. So congenital surgery, baby surgery, stuff that's done at Children's in Omaha more, the pulmonary valve can be involved, all right? And in fact, in the kids, they already have this available to them for certain instances for the pulmonary valve, yeah, which has been quite useful. You know, come some of those kids have had, they end up having lots of surgeries, lots of operations. So this can be very useful for them. So those are the two valves that we didn't talk much about. We do work on the tricuspid. That's not uncommon. But that's usually because we had to work on the mitral valve or the aortic valve. And that's relatively more straightforward. Pulmonary doesn't, doesn't have much issues at all in adults. Yeah. So. How can you prevent leaky valves? Any prevention? I don't, I don't, um, you know, uh, nothing that nothing that you could nothing that you could go out and say I want to prevent me having a leaky valve. I think that uh, uh, you know, good health. Uh, there are some medicines that can affect your valve, but usually you don't know you're going to be having those. That's very unusual. Uh, well, there can be a little bit of a family association, perhaps. Yep, like mitral valve prolapse is a is a early early issue with a leaky valve. There's some family uh, interaction with that, but, you know, knock on wood, usually that's more uh, well tolerated, often doesn't give problems, but good to know of because you may have to take antibiotics for certain things if it's significant. And that is not caused by AEG? No, correct. Not at all. It's not. One of the good things not caused by aging. That's good. <laughs> you had that long before you did. <laughs> Whoever said there were golden Go ahead. <laughs> How much physical work can you do with a new valve like that? It's like going to tend to wear it out quicker, probably. Uh, which, you know, any any kind of heart valve in general, or this, this, the this. Or the if your valve has been replaced or even repaired, and once you recover from the operation, the surgery, you should be able to go out and do what you want to do. There shouldn't be any restrictions, okay, from the valve itself. The valve's not going to pop or burst or tear or anything like that, okay? So there shouldn't be any restrictions, and that's, you know, what we really try to tell people. Now, you know, again, if you, if, if, you're, uh, have a med if you have a mechanical valve and you think you're going to go skydiving, it's probably not a good idea because you may <laughs> fall with the coon or, or horse riding. You know, horse riding is an issue. People think about the, if they're big ranchers and that kind of stuff, then, then, then they often don't want to just run that risk with a mechanical valve. So that, that's very reasonable. Uh, very reasonable not to, 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 to get a mechanical valve, absolutely. And even some younger folks that are, you know, employed, do a lot of heavy lifting, manual work, or they're, they're, they, they, they're uh, plumbers or whatever, they, they, you know, the cuts and stuff, they can't take it. They said just. You know, if, if I need to have my valve replaced, give me one of these tissue valves, and I'll see you in 10 years. Uh, it doesn't sound as crazy, but, you know, if people got work and jobs, that's what they want to do. So we hear that more and more. Yeah. They yeah. tend to wear quicker. The younger you are, you tend to wear it out. If you're less than 65, you're, 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 
a little more likely to wear things out. But, you know, for the, the aortic valve, <clears throat> it's not uncommon for a person to be in their mid-50s and want to have a tissue valve, okay? The mitral valve tends to wear out a little bit quicker in younger folks. Not in older folks, but in younger folks. So in, uh, there's a less of that in the real younger people for a mitral valve. And, and like I say, you try to repair the mitral valve the best you can, younger folks. You want, go ahead. The tissue aortic valve, uh, can you expect improvement in your breathing, uh, that type of thing? Uh, or is it going to be maintenance uh, at a level? Or at, uh, you know, your, 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 your breathing should be better. It should be better, yeah. To relieve that, that narrowing, it really should make you feel better. It really, it really should, all right. Uh, you know, if it doesn't, then I would first thing to look at the valve, make sure the valve's working and it hasn't had this rare sort of early degeneration where it sort of is narrowing down again. Then perhaps look at other reasons why you may not have that breathing like you thought you should have. Or you, know, you should know kind of in the first month or so how you're doing. If, if, if you got really good, you felt good, then you know six months later something happened where ah, something's wrong, you gotta get checked out. Got to get checked out, yeah. But typically, people feel better and, and get around more, have a little more spunk, not as quite as fatigued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but the, the last thing I say about the valve really, really has to be bad before what we'd recommend surgery. Lots of grading is how bad the valve is. Severe. That that would make it, people recommend having it fixed. Okay. Yeah. Where is the track? Okay. The tricuspid is located just opposite the mitral. Okay, it's right over here. Right over here. All right. Since you asked, when you're in the bit when you're in the fetus, these two things are right together. Aortic, pulmonary, they look very similar. All right? So you can figure out when you're developing in utero in the, as a fetus. Tricuspid mitral also are similar, okay? Kind of close together, kind of close together, so they're sort of similar, all right? Last thing I'd say, kind of very, very interesting. Very, very interesting operation. Not done that frequently. This is your aortic valve. This is your pulmonary valve. So in really young people, you can take this valve out here, Take this valve out here, move this valve over here, and then get a valve off the shelf from a cadaver and put it in over here. That's called a ROS procedure, R-O-S-S. It's a very, very good operation in younger folks. Not done freq uh, that frequently, probably done more at children's because it's in younger kids, but actually in the right patient population, it's a very good operation. So just that's more of a, a side kind of thing. I'll hang around if you've got more questions. So that's good, but uh, whatever. Yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, a question regarding antibiotics after a valve um, is repaired, replaced, you're on antibiotics. How would you know if that antibiotic, if something's wrong or, OK, you're going in for dental work yeah. and have antibiotics. Yeah. Well, you would often, and typically you, would, you, you wouldn't feel well. You would feel like crud, and you'd have fevers, you'd get run down, you'd get just fatigued like the Dickens, okay? Yeah. It, I don't believe it'd be subtle. You would have, you would have chosen to see a doctor, all right? Well, if you have a leaky valve, uh, do you have to take antibiotics and go to the dentist? No. Now, uh, you know, if you have though, if you, you have like a little prolapse, then you may get it, okay? Because they may be a little bit more susceptible to things, depending on how bad that prolapse is, okay? But uh, if you have a valve replacement, you should have a valve repair, mitral valve prolapse. She she'd asked about, but in general, no, okay? In general, no. Okay. 